Thank you, Lord, for your blessings on me. There's a roof up above me, and a good place to sleep. There is food on my tables and shoes on my feet. You gave me your love, Lord, and a fine family. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings on me. a roof up above me and a good place to sleep. There is food on my tables and shoes on my feet. You gave me your love, Lord, and a fine family. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings on me. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings on me. Anybody thankful today? Are you truly thankful today? Yeah. Another song says, Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. just want to thank you, Lord. Come on, say, been so good. Let's sing it together. Been so good. That's your testimony. He's been so bowed, eyes are closed, as together we pray. And so, Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the ways that you've made, for the doors you opened and the doors you shut. And now in this moment, we're asking that the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit would move in abundance during the preaching time. Hide me behind the cross, not me but thee, O Lord, to be seen and high and lifted up. And my prayer, once again, is that you would remove everything in me that is not like you. Please don't let the sermon get in the way of the message, nor the preacher in the way of the cross. And let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, you are our strength. You are our strength and our redeemer. Let all the Lord's children say amen. Amen. We're grateful this month for being Women's History Month. And it's being celebrated across the length and breadth of our country. And all of us today can say thank you to some woman, because without them, we would not be here. 
So we thank every woman for their valiant and valuable contribution to our society. I want to turn your attention back to the Gospel of Luke. We were there last week in chapter, tw- chapter 19 last week or in chapter 23 this week, Luke chapter 23, verses 35 through 39. As we uncover more on our journey to Calvary, next week in many churches across the country, yeah, across the world, many churches will hold sunrise services, many churches will have special productions commemorating and celebrating what can be described as the single most important act of history that the world has ever seen. And that is the death of our Lord and Savior on Calvary. And so next week we'll come, we'll celebrate his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And as we do every week, we will celebrate his soon coming. For surely salvation does not stop at the cross. Salvation does not stop at the cross. Jesus is coming again. Luke, the 23rd chapter, verses 35 through 39. I want to read it to you from the New International Version, and here ends the reading of the Word of God. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said he saved others. Let him save himself, if he is God's Messiah, the Chosen One. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was written there was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. I want to preach from this subject this afternoon for the next few moments, a condemning confession from Calvary. A condemning confession from Calvary. As we continue on the journey, traveling the road to the resurrection, by this time Jesus has already entered Jerusalem riding on a donkey. He's already caused the commotion and unrest in the temple cursed an unproductive fig tree, had the last supper with his disciples. He's been betrayed by Judas, He's been forsaken by his close friends in Gethsemane, been denied by Peter, been beaten and scourged with cat and nine tails. Jesus has been mocked by Herod and his men of war. He's been substituted by Barabbas, He's been rejected by his own people, He's been tried and convicted by Pilate, has been escorted up the road to Calvary and is now hanging on a cross in between two thieves. Lighthouse, I want us to be clear about something this afternoon. Jesus is being executed as an enemy of the state. He is an inconvenience to be avoided, a challenge that cannot be answered, a problem that cannot be solved, an invitation that cannot be ignored, and because they can't do anything with him, they decide that they will do away with him. For many of these leaders, scribes, Pharisees, political figures, Jesus is in the way. He is messing with the Pharisees' money, power, and security. The life that he lives and the message that he teaches and preaches will ultimately bring down a system that powerful people are trying to protect. I want you to understand by reading the life and ministry of Jesus. Jesus was a radical man with a radical message that made people nervous. He dares to live by another set of rules, rules which aim to reach higher, to push for harder, to strive for greater. And what's worse is that this clear message is getting through. Lives are being transformed because minds are being set free. People are beginning to question everything they've ever known and looking for God in a way that they never have. 
Jesus is literally changing the culture. He has pulled back the covers and exposing all the lies. And so he becomes a threat to the status quo. They, they, they had to get rid of him. And I think I ought to pause right here and make a commercial. One of the fastest ways to become an opponent of popularity, one of the quickest ways to enter into confrontation, one of the quickest ways to get killed is to start fooling with somebody's money. Folk will put up with you just for about anything that you do, but start messing around with people's money and their finances and they will get rid of you quick. And so Jesus has been tortured, brutalized, and crucified. The Bible tells us that a crown of thorns is placed on his head while his hands and feet are nailed to the cross. The carpenter of Nazareth, that poor righteous teacher, has finally been silenced. And when we arrive at our text, we find that the crucifixion of Jesus is being played in front of the entire world. Every eye everywhere is watching. Most people are disgusted and watching in horror. But for some, this was an opportunity to poke fun at him. Verse 35 makes it clear that the people were watching him and even the leaders with them sneered and said, he saved others. Now let him save himself. In verse 36, we find the soldiers getting on, in on the act by offering sour wine and talk, taunting him. If you are king of the Jews, save yourself. By verse 39, every one of the ones condemned to die with him is joining in. Even one of the ones condemned to die with him is joining in on the mockery. If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. And as I read this text, Lighthouse, I immediately concluded that the problem, the tension in the text was one of an identity crisis. I concluded that Jesus' identity was at the core of the passage. After all, if people only knew who he really was, then there's no way they could treat him the way they were treating him. I said to myself, these people are really not aware of who Jesus really is. They fail to appreciate the fact that he is indeed the Son of God. I concluded that even at that moment, Jesus may have even been, even have been tempted to doubt his identity. Hear the question again, if you are the chosen of God, if you are the king of the Jews, if you are Christ's son, at least three times in four verses this question has been raised. There seems to be serious doubt as to whether or not Jesus is who he says he is. Well, why all these questions? Because Jesus is not acting the way they thought a Messiah should. Stay with me. I'm going to teach it for a while. He does not fit the profile of what the Jews expected out of a hero. He did not overthrow the Romans, neither did he elevate the Jews. He did not usher in the kingdom that people expected. He didn't come riding in on a Mustang or a valiant horse. He did not lead an army. He possessed no wealth. Jesus' identity seems to be in question because he failed to live up to people's expectations. And as that sat on me, I began to think, didn't the devil even try to get Jesus to doubt his identity? Didn't he ask, if you are the son of God, turn these stones into bread? It started to click to me, Lighthouse. This whole thing was hinging on identity, knowing who you are. And I got all excited in my study as I thought about how the devil must be trying to get you and I to doubt our identity. And so based on if you are the son of God in these three texts, I got ready to shout on the fact that we need to know who Jesus is so that we really know who we are. I began to celebrate the fact that there is a victory in knowing who the Son of God is. And once we properly identify the Son of God, we are ready to receive the salvation of God. I even saw the thief on the cross recognize the innocence of Jesus that led him to ask Jesus to remember him when he comes into his kingdom. I was ready to tell Lighthouse that once we recognize who he is, it will define who we are. The thief on the cross recognizes him and dies with the hope of everything 
everlasting life. I was ready to preach that, elders. That is until I realized that the issue that is being addressed in the text, the primary issue is not one of identity. Identity crisis is the secondary issue in the text. Now, let me be clear. The people in Jesus' day are not aware of who he really is. They fail to recognize that he is the son of God. They, are, they, they fail to recognize that he is God in the flesh. They are blinded by their own agendas so that they cannot see what is plainly obvious to you and I. But the identity piece only works when you look at the text in the English. A closer look at the text from the original language reveals that we might need to change our focus. Closer look at the text reveals that we might be focusing our attention on an issue that the text may allude to, but does not primarily focus on. Now remember that this whole line of reasoning begins with the question, if you are. Let the church say, if you are. Now, I, I want to I wanna help you. The word if gives us the impression that questions are being asked surrounding the identity of Jesus. If, however, in the Greek is the word ei, but does not really translate to the word if. Okay? The word ei in the Greek translates better to the word since or because. Are you still with me? So, if gives the idea of interrogation. But since or because makes it declaration. The leaders, the soldiers, and the unrepentant thief are actually saying that Jesus is the king of the Jews. They said, since you are the king of the Jews, they declare openly that Jesus is the son of God, the king of the Jews, and Christ, even when Jesus didn't say it openly, they did. So what's the issue? The issue is that they made a true statement. They made a public declaration. They professed the truth concerning Jesus, but they did it to mock him and not to celebrate him. I'm coming somewhere with this thing. They did it spitefully. They did it to feel, they did it, and they were full of resentment, animosity, and hatred. They had no intention of giving Jesus the respect due the king of the Jews. They would not give him the reverence due to the Son of God. They would not worship him, obey him, or submit to him. Now let's go back to verse 35 in Luke chapter 23. Verse 35 informs us that the people along with their rulers, those who were supposed to know better, sneered at him. That word sneered in the Greek means to turn up the nose toward in ridicule. Verse 36 tells us that the soldiers also mocked him. Now that word, enipizon, means that they refused to take him seriously. They, they made him the butt of their jokes. They gave him common sour wine, hardly the drink that one would give a king. They were denigrating him. Verse 39 tells us that the cheat, that the thief blasphemed him. Now that word, it blasphemei, means to demean through speech, slander, defame, speak irreverently about, disrespectfully about, or impiously about. By the way, the way the verbs are written suggests that the people, don't miss this, they kept on sneering, mocking, and blaspheming the Son of God. Now, the real issue in the text is not that they did not know who Jesus was, but they used the truth about who he was to insult and degrade him. In other words, they turned the truth about him into a weapon against him. Now, here is the sad irony in this passage. The truth was in their mouth, but not in their heart. Let me take it a little bit further. The people in the text had enough information about the Messiah. They understood that he would be the chosen of God. They know he would be a deliverer. They know that he would establish a new kingdom. In other words, they possessed good doctrine. 
Now, here's the clearest picture of the depravity of humanity, where we are as humans. With all the information about the Messiah available to them, the profiles from their own prophets, historical clues about from their scriptures, signs and wonders performed before their very eyes, even some of them were witness to when they asked who Jesus was in the garden and they fell back. Even some of them, they still refused to accept Jesus for who he is. Isaiah 53 verse 12 says, and he was numbered with the transgressors. He was placed in the middle of two thieves and made the worst of them. Can you see the irony here? The ultimate giver is made the chief of three people. Now, hanging on the cross was reserved for the worst of criminals. And particularly, the one who was hung in the middle is considered by all the worst of the three. Isn't it interesting that he who knew no sin became the worst of sin? Oh my goodness, I'm feeling good right now. I know I'm going to preach this hard today, but this thing is good to me. The one who knew no sin is the one who became the worst of sinners so that he could exercise his power to offer you and I salvation even though the priest, the leaders, the thief, the soldiers, even though they mocked him and they were there, he died for those of us living today who do the same thing that these people did that day. But he hung there on the cross. One old preacher said he died until the sun went on the back porch of heaven and refused to shine. Passage, the people in our passage, Jews along with elders, soldiers and the thief made declarations concerning Jesus that they did not believe. They confessed, but they weren't converted and neither would they conform. They made public confessions about God that were not sincere, genuine, or meaningful. They proclaimed the truth about the lordship of Jesus while intentionally refusing to accept him as Lord of all. What they said, watch very closely, what they said could have saved them. Confessing Jesus as the Son of God, the chosen one, the Christ, but instead it would condemn them. Now, one thief on the cross said, well, you claim to be God, save yourself and us. The other thief said, we did what they accused us of. This man didn't do anything wrong. When you come into your kingdom, have mercy, Jesus. Lord, remember me. The thief who blasphemed Jesus was moving towards condemnation. But the thief who confessed genuinely Jesus made his way towards salvation. Ah, listen, 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 listen. The thief and the leaders who, who made the confession mocking him, watch this, they could have used the opportunity to gain access to heaven, but instead it would condemn them to hell. Now, I know this is a tense moment, but we don't like to hear that word. But how do we know that they have condemned themselves to hell? Revelation 1 verse 7, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Could it be lighthouse uh, that, that in some ways we are guilty of the same crimes? Could it be that we too make confessions about God that we are not willing to live up to? Could it be that our worship on Sabbath is betrayed by our living during the week? Could it be that what we confess with our mouths while true actually brings Jesus open shame when people observe how we live, how we speak? Could it be that we are blaspheming when we say that he is our Lord when we really don't mean it? Could it be that, we, that, that, that we're taking the name of our God in vain when we say that he has saved us but we refuse to live like we're being saved? 
we come to understand through observing the people in Luke 23, watch this, don't miss this, that good doctrine, good teaching, good lessons, good principle is not enough to save anyone. They all had good doctrine, but they refused, they used it to shame and ridicule the Son of God. Eventually, good doctrine got Jesus killed. I want to pause here for station identification to help somebody understand. It doesn't matter how many scripture you memorize. If you don't put it into practice, you've got good doctrine, but you are not exercising relationship. Oh, got quiet right there. It's okay to know the procedures and protocols of the organization. Because we ought, to be, we ought to be educated on what causes us to work efficiently. But there's got to be a balance between your doctrine and your relationship. Don't allow your doctrine to get in the way of your relationship to the point where you confess with your mouth but don't believe with your heart. That's called exterior religion. It works for the people watching you, but it has no meaning for the God who knows everything about you. These leaders, these scribes, these soldiers, they mocked Jesus. They sneered at him. They blasphemed him. And, and Pilate had that inscription above on the cross in those three languages, Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. And scholars suggest that Pilate put that there not because he agreed with what they did, even though he sold Jesus out. Not that he agreed what they did, but he put that there to remind the Jews that the person they were crucifying really didn't do anything wrong. But let's be honest, we've got a group pilot with the rest of them because even though he put that sign, he still sent him away to be crucified. I, I want to say something's going to sound a little bit tense, but you'll live after today. Doctrine is necessary but relationship with Christ is priority. Okay. All right. They had good doctrine, good teachings. But what good is your teaching if it does not move people into a closer relationship with the Savior? So what happens? So what happens when we have good doctrine without relationship? Here's the answer. People die. Now somebody's looking at me and say, Preacher, you know, I came to church today, and so far I haven't heard any good news. Is there anything that I can celebrate in this text? Where is the hope for the child of God today? Well, I'm glad you asked because I have the answer. I want to inform you that hope comes in the form of a proclamation and a petition. So if an insincere confession can get you lost, then a sincere confession can get you saved. In one thief's confession, we already discovered, we find the way to condemnation. In another thief's petition, we are granted a model of salvation. Watch again what the repentant said in verse 41. And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. This thief was admitting that he was a thief and that he deserved the punishment he was getting. He was declaring that the wages of sin is death. He all but admitted that the judgment against him was valid lighthouse and that the law, in fact, was good. He admitted that he was a sinner. Then he goes on to call Jesus Lord in verse 43, saying, Lord, remember me, because we have been calling Jesus Lord for so long, we might not be able to appreciate what the thief said. But I'm going to go back to it again. He called him Lord, one having full power or control, 
one who is authorized, one who's competent, one who is supreme. Our thief was able to see in a moment what others could not see over decades. He really realized that Jesus was the Christ, the chosen of God. And he confessed Jesus as his Lord, Master, Supreme Ruler. He asked for citizenship in the kingdom of God. Now, if you need a reason to get happy, please consider that this man is making this request. He's on his way to the grave. This is his fade to black moment. His finale, if you would. His curtain closer. He's on his way to the grave, and knowing that his life is hanging in the balance, rather than continuing to blaspheme with them, he chose to confess Jesus as Lord and Savior. I need to tell somebody today, it doesn't matter what everybody else around you is saying about Jesus. You make sure you know who Jesus is for yourself. And just in case you need a reminder, I stopped by to give you some reminder. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's the rose of Sharon. He's the lily of the valley. He's the alpha and the omega. He's the bright and morning star. He's a way out of no way. He's Mary's baby boy. He's a healer. He's a physician. He's a way maker. He's my savior. He's my redeemer. When I had no way out, Jesus stepped in right on time. When I couldn't see my way, he made my dark way clear. Jesus has been everything that I need him to be. And even today, while I'm sitting here trying to figure out what life holds next, while I'm trying to figure it out, Jesus has already worked it out. And where did he work it out? He worked it out on a skull-shaped hill on Calvary where he hung between two thieves and when everything was going on that was against him, he reared his head back, mustered up the strength to say, Father, forgive them. This thief says, Lord, when you come into your kingdom, <laughs> remember me. I done preached myself happy. Made me get off my time limit here. Uh, let, me, let me really help you. This thief, the repentant thief, didn't even have good doctrine. Mr. Salman, put me back in the monitor. Thank you very much. He did not understand what he was asking for. Jesus was going to die just like he was. And yet the man is asking for kingdom consideration. He believed that some way, somehow, Jesus would return as a conquering king. His, his was a thinking, he, was, he, he wasn't thinking about another earthly kingdom where Jesus would reign, reign and rule. His theology was a little bit off, but his relationship was sincere. He was short on doctrine, but strong on sincerity. The good news today, Lighthouse, is that all it takes to be saved is the sincere confession of Jesus as Lord and Savior. I'm going to prove it to you in the Bible, Romans 10 verse 9, if thou shalt confess with the mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in the heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. I feel like, I feel like bless, blessing the name of the Lord today. I feel like praising his name because the thief got saved the same way that you and I are saved. For by grace are we saved through faith. Not of ourselves. It is a gift of God, lest any man should boast. He got in on grace through faith. All he did was to believe, and it was credited to him for righteousness. He didn't earn it. He believed Jesus for it. Good religion didn't get him in, and good religion can't get you in. Good doctrine didn't get him in, and good religion can't get you in. Good behavior didn't get him in, and good behavior can't get you in. Good pedigree didn't get him in, and good pedigree won't get you in. Family connections, healthy living, denominational affiliation, ministry credentials, 
credentials, social standing, church standards, they didn't get him in and they won't get you in either. Educational background didn't get him in and it certainly won't get you in. Years of service, he had no hookup, he had no honor, he had no mercy, he had no merit, but he got in. He was not good, he was not holy, he was not righteous, but he got in. He made mistakes, he came short, he had his issues, but he got in. How did he get in? He got in on grace through faith. Jesus got him in because he recognized that the person he was hanging beside was no ordinary person. It was Jesus, the Savior of the world. And what God is looking for today is sincere confession about who he is. Today I want to ask you, as the musicians come, is Jesus your Lord? Have you surrendered everything to him? Is he your master or are you just making fun of him? What does Jesus really mean to you? Who is he? Is he somebody you just want to bless you with money? Or is he who you need to make sure that your soul is saved so that you can get into heaven? Let me tell you who Jesus is to me. He's everything. And when I can't find any more words to describe him, he fills in the empty space. I tell people everywhere I go, I don't care if I'm the last person in. As long as my feet are on the inside of the pearly gates. And whether I say it verbally or I live it socially, wherever I go, people will know that Jesus is my Lord. Don't make the mistake of traveling through life saying he's Lord but then not living it. Don't take it for granted that we have inexhaustible days left on this earth. 152 people on that plane thought they were headed to the next destination. And suddenly, without warning, without provocation, their lives were taken just like that. When I was growing up, the preacher always used to say, don't put off tomorrow what you can do today. Tomorrow is not promised. The truth of the matter is the end of today is not promised. And I'm not trying to scare you. I want to paint a clear and real picture for us as the body of Christ. Jesus is coming soon. Everything is pointing towards it. So today, who is he to you? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Somebody here today is saying, you know, I've never... I've never made Jesus my Lord and Savior. I've never confessed him to be Savior of my life. As a matter of fact, I've probably been using his name in vain way more than I meant to. But today, I want something different. Today, I'm not making a condemned confession. Today, I'm making a converted confession that Jesus is my all in all. If that's you today, I want you to stand to your feet. Today you're confessing that Jesus is your all in all. You're not going to side with the people who are mocking and making fun of him. Jesus is your all in all. And then there may be somebody here today who the Spirit of God is moving on, on your heart. You didn't plan this today, but the Holy Spirit is working. You're saying, you know what? Not only do I confess Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, but I want to join a church that believes in Jesus and that is serious about making heaven our eternal home. Part of our mission is preparing people for the kingdom. Today, somebody here just wants to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You want to be baptized into the family of Christ. You want to experience that wonderful moment going into the watery grave, going in with the old life,
but coming up with a new life in Christ. If that's you, I want you to lift your hand where you are. Lift your hand where you are. You want to be baptized. God bless you, my brother. God bless you, my brother. Our brother from last week is reaffirming his commitment. Anybody else? You're saying, I want to be baptized. The Lord is speaking to my heart. and I want to be in that number. I want to be baptized. I want to make my calling and election sure. I confess today that Jesus is Lord of my life. And I, say, I want to signify that through baptism. If that's, who, if that's you, where are you? Where are you? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Father in heaven, we thank you today for dying on the cross for sinners like us. I pray, oh God, that you will touch the decisions of everyone standing on their feet, even those who could not stand because they're unable, but you know where their heart is. God, help us today that there will be symmetry between the way we live and the Jesus we confess as our Savior. I pray, Heavenly Father, that our lives submitted to your will will be part of transforming a culture where more and more people find the urgency to connect with Jesus Christ. I pray, God, that you be with the man, woman, boy, or girl who even right now is contemplating baptism. They may not have raised their hand today. They may not have come forward today, but God, continue to work on them. Continue to shower your mercy and your grace on them. Help them to know that primary and priority to being with you is relationship. They've got to confess with their mouth and believe in their heart. God, I pray that you'll continue to work on these, your children. And Lord, may we leave here today energized, transformed by the power of your word. Tell somebody else that we have indeed been with the Lord. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you remain standing for the closing hymn and the benediction?
guys should be seated for just one moment. We're going to ask the ushers to quickly come forth. We're going to take up the survey at this time. We're going to quickly do this. You have filled it out. If you have not, take a quick moment to complete it so that we may have it before you leave. Amen. still have a survey, just hold, hold it up for the ushers to come by and get it. Still one in the back. of department, please meet up in the choir room for the personal ministers meeting. Would you please stand? Let us pray. Our God and our Heavenly Father, today we have truly heard you speak to us through your manservant. Father, it is our desire that when those go in the kingdom to remember us, so that we will be able to be able to walk into your heavenly kingdom when Jesus shall return. We ask you, Lord, that you will bless us now. Help us, dear Lord, that we reflect what we have heard here today and live them out in our daily lives. Bless us now as we wait upon thee today. These mercies we do humbly ask. In Jesus' name we pray. 